was going to record it and I forgot. So we are now recording. Excellent. Thank you for interrupting, John. All right. So um, just very quick recap for the recording. Uh, we're going to be doing some uh, command demoing and looking at a few pages. So this is going to be online stuff. Hopefully that doesn't break while we're using it. Um, the big concern for me uh, as a member of the core team um, in making a stable release of Civi CRM and D8 is maintainability, which is to say that we get continuous feedback from our test suite, from our QA regime, indicating that the D8 build will work or it will not work. Um, similarly, we need a reference point uh, for triage and manual testing, where somebody comes on to Mattermost or Stack Exchange and they report a problem, and we need to see if the problem is reproducible in a basic build or if it's something that's dependent on the environment. Um, and thirdly, if somebody comes in from, say, a Drupal 8 perspective and they start using Civi CRM, there needs to be a path to escalate where they. <laughs> Uh, can start contributing to it and developing on it. Um, so the the synthesis of all these things is we need to automate our build a bit better um, so that we can build from Git, build from patches, and so on. All right. Let me see. So uh, let's... Oh, and I wanted to also note, um, just as another bit of context, that uh, the Civi D8 port, I feel, has been a much longer road than the Civi backdrop port, which is interesting because they were both projects where we start out taking Civi CRM on Drupal 7 and adapting uh, the code to a set of APIs that, well, they have differences, they also have a lot of similarities. And I think that the backdrop project converted a lot faster than the D8 project, primarily because the build system was different. The distribution channel was different. Um, with backdrop, it basically mirrored the D7 distribution channel. With D8, the distribution channel got thrown up in the air and all of the little bits of wiring between the components uh, were affected by that. All right. So moving on, um, highlights, if you are a developer, a contributor, um, how does D8 fit into our QA regimen? Uh, on test.jenkins.org, we have a series of jobs which monitor the health of the code base and the repos. And there is this matrix E2E, the end-to-end -end matrix. And the purpose of the end-to-end -end matrix is to install Civi CRM on several different types of uh, CMS. So we have a Drupal 7 CMS, we have a Drupal 8 CMS, Backdrop, WordPress, uh, and you know we would love to have Joomla, though that's more difficult to automate. Um, and we have a new addition here, the two more line items showing up in this matrix, Drupal 8 clean and D8 PRJ clean. Uh, I will come back in a few minutes to what the difference is between Drupal 8 clean and D8 PRJ clean. But the important thing is that we are getting some red flags here. Um, we also have some gray flags. That's because Civi CRM supports uh, older versions of PHP and MySQL that maybe aren't supported on Drupal 8. So we only evaluate um, Civi plus D8 on a newer uh, combination of PHP and MySQL. Uh, however, what is cool about this is if I drill down, I see a list of test failures. And this is a real failure in the build that it's testing. Um, what it, it's saying is that it has tried to run the REST test, which connects to the REST endpoint over, over HTTP. It's a full round trip test. Um, and issue some API calls and check that the results are sane. It doesn't test every single aspect of the API. It's just a sanity check that we can connect to the REST endpoint and is producing failures. 
it's producing failures because <laughs> because it doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. So uh, that's a good signal. And this is one of the items that I have on my list to file as new issues in DA. Um, hopefully going forward, we patch that, these become green, and uh, for future releases, we're able to skim uh, this chart and see that we have suites passing on all of our builds. Uh, the next thing that's useful, if you are familiar with the demo.civicrm.org sites, there are several of these, so DMaster is probably the one that most people have seen, which is Drupal 7 running Civicrm Master. There's WP Master for WordPress, and now we have D8 Master. The build isn't tuned quite as much as the D7 one is, but it does have a few things, demo users with a default password of demo demo, um, and some permissions for logging in and seeing city CRM. We come in here and we can browse around. Very good. Straightforward enough. Uh, in the near future, I expect that we will be adding PR tests to the Drupal 8 Civi CRM repo uh, so that when a patch is submitted against the Drupal 8 integration module, it can run some of the E2E tests and some of the uh, unit tests as well. All right. So I'd like to show a little bit how to create a Git-based demo site um, or development site for running tests uh, on Civi and D8. Uh, this will assume that we have BuildKit installed. If you don't have BuildKit, then uh, that's a topic on the uh, developer guide. And you can ask questions about it on Mattermost in the Dev Newcomers channel. Uh, Let's see, so I'm gonna create a new site called Drupal 8. Let's actually give it another name. Let's just call it uh, DMB 8. And I'm gonna say that it is a type Drupal clean. And here's, for me, it looks small, but it's the most important thing about this. We can specify different branches in here. So we can use the master branch of all of the Civi repos, or we can pull in the RC branch for 522 or for 521. Let's go with master. Uh, there, okay, so I'm looking at chat while uh, this runs, and there's a question. I'm not familiar with uh, CiviCRM's unit tests, but wouldn't those unit tests give some assurance that things will continue to work or not break? And that is an excellent point. Um, and within CiviCRM's QA regimen, there are multiple test suites that address different parts of um, uh, the stability and I don't know the, the testing. So uh, the unit tests tend to be more focused on uh, smaller parts of the system and exercising many different iterations of that. So within the API, you have a contact API and there are 20 or 100 or God knows how many tests of different ways to load contact records. Um, and the mechanics of loading a contact record work the same on any CMS. So we run that test and that gives us some assurance that loading a contact record will work anywhere that Civi CRM works. There are also parts of the project that are different on every CMS. So each CMS has a different uh, life cycle for composing a page 
and putting JavaScript tags up at the top of the page. Um, and each CMS has a different system for identifying a user account and checking that the user is logged in. Um, so those kinds of things don't get covered by the unit tests. We actually need to spin up a full system with the CMS and Civi uh, in order to validate those. Um, so the E2E suite, which we saw in that matrix, is focused on that kind of issue. All right, uh, there's a question, is uh, this different from the Round Earth Composer project? And the short answer is that yes, it is. Um, it is heavily based on the Round Earth Composer project. A lot of the uh, ideas and work in here come from there. However, there are a couple of uh, assumptions slash shortcuts that were necessary in uh, the initial development of the Round Earth uh, project slash plugin uh, that are acceptable for deploying in production, but are not so good for deploying from Git. In particular, uh, Civi CRM has this code generation system that is used for a number of years, uh, where it scans some XML files, then it produces some SQL files that correspond to the XML files. And when you run the installation, it uses those SQL files. The problem is that when you download from Git, you don't have a copy of those SQL files. You need a way to run the code generator. The Rounder uh, plugin addresses that by downloading a tarball, which happens to have a copy of the SQL files, and uh, then extracting the SQL files and using those for installation. Um, however, if you're writing a patch, which does anything that involves the SQL structure, um, you're not going to get uh, a matching set of SQL files by downloading the last stable tarball. Similarly, if you are working on the master branch, you're not going to get the SQL files that correspond to the master branch. You're going to get the SQL files that were published in the last stable release. Um, so that, that's one of the biggest differences compared to the Round Earth uh, Composer plugin. All right, so our build has finished. And we're just going to CD into there. And actually, a good question would be where is Civi CRM, right? There we are. So, um, vendor Civi CRM, Civi CRM core. And I'm just going to spit this out because. Uh, I happen to know it, and I suspect a lot of folks who do development know this. I want to show that it works. Um, if this is not too familiar, then I would suggest looking at the developer guide. God willing, there's a section of the developer guide that tells you how to run unit tests. Uh, PHP unit E2E, and let's take the core unit tests, the E2E core, so we're getting some success there. Uh, there's one test failure, okay, good information, maybe something to fix, maybe it's a flaky test. Uh, we can also do API before details. All right, so our tests are running on the build that we just created. Um, Let's see. And we also have in Civi, most of our CI is based off of a script called Civi Test Run, or at least we've moved our stuff into there, uh, which will take a build that we've produced, such as tempd8, produce some JUnit output, 
and we can specify generally which suites we want to run. So we could run the entire end-to-end -end suite and the API v4 suite and so on. And this would take forever, so we're not going to actually run all of the tests. The important thing is that the glue of building a D8 site and running all of the tests is there and giving us useful output. Okay, so um, something that I think, so I want to step back a little bit because um, we've done a couple of quick things, right? Like if you're doing development, you can quickly go to testcivicrm.org. If you're spinning up a test site, you run this civi build command, it produces something and that's fine. But we haven't talked much about the internals or um, the structure of this thing. And I wanted to step back for just a second on Composer because while I was working on this, I felt very important to draw some boundaries um, between the way certain packages work. And I, I personally found it a little confusing, uh, some of the expectations that I had reading different Composer documents. And I, I think the crux of the issue is that it is very important to differentiate between two kinds of packages in Composer, right? Composer is a, is a dependency management system. It downloads software for you. And everything that it fetches, it calls a package. When you create a new project, a new route, that is a package, right? And it depends on other packages. The other things are libraries. Um, but the, the discipline you have and the tools that are available to you are different depending on whether you are writing a project or a library, right? And I thought there was actually a neat um, document here uh, where they talk about 24 tips for using Composer effectively, right? And I really liked how tip number two lined up with this, um, this view uh, that I, I had uh, sort of organically developed. Um, and <clears throat> they actually make some good points about the way in which you work differently in a root project versus a, li a library. So a root project versions, you can be very precise. You can say, I need Symfony YAML version 3.0.2, right? I always want it to be that because I'm going to be deploying to production. I'm going to be replicating this code across multiple servers. I want to make sure that it's the exact same thing everywhere I release, right? But a library doesn't deploy to one single environment, right? A library is published for many others to consume, and they get to choose what environment to put it in. So a library needs to be more accepting of different versions. Um, Composer.lock is the document which lists the specific revisions of each thing. So they suggest in your root project, it is good to commit the Composer.lock, again, to pro provide reproducibility. Whereas in the library, if you want to be very disciplined about um, freely mixing your library with other things, you shouldn't rely on a Composer.lock at all. The uh, range of versions is more important than the than the one specific version that you've been testing against. And I think this is interesting um, coming from a Civi CRM perspective because Civi CRM kind of lives in between these two constructs. Um, we don't have quite that same discipline historically in Civi um, because Civi CRM is an application, right? It actually integrates a whole lot of libraries and provides a UI, but it is also a library. It's something that you can embed inside of your Drupal 8 site or your Drupal 7 site or your WordPress site. Um, so we kind of walk this line where on one hand Civi is a root, but it is also a library. And I think that in the long term for uh, Civi to be usable within a composer structure, it needs to feel more like a library to consumers than like a root. 
right? Okay, and I want to talk a little bit about where I think Composer is strong and where it gets weak, right? I think Composer is strongest when you're doing something like this. Make a new project. Composer in it. Okay. Composer require uh, Symphony YAML. And with this one command and just the name of a library or a project that I want to build on top of, I get a copy of it and I can use it pretty much immediately. And if I want more, I can get more. Um, and I'm sort of free to keep throwing in more things, right? That's really nice. There are several projects, several Git repos I have where it really feels easy to work with Composer um, because this is all I'm doing. I'm just saying, get a library, get a library. Where it starts, but it starts to break down um, in some cases. And one of the biggest weaknesses, for example, is that it deals with PHP classes. It doesn't deal very effectively with JavaScript files and CSS files. If you start looking for documentation in the Composer world about how to deal with JavaScript and CSS, you will find 10 different ways to do it. Um, and each of them is you know, nice on its own. If you are responsible for a project, for a route, then you have a lot of freedom to choose among those 10 different ways of managing assets um, and make everything in your project line up to that. But if you are a library provider uh, and you don't own the project, you have to be a little more flexible to, to adapt to the different kinds of projects that you get put into. Um, even within the Drupal community, we have an example of um, needing to adapt to different project structures because the Drupal community has two different structures that they use for Composer, for D8, right? One of them is called the Drupal Composer Drupal Project. Actually, yeah. The other one uh, is the legacy template, they call it now. But you might also think of it as the tarball from drupal.org. Or if you run drush dl, it's what you get. Right, so if I go over to my next build, yeah. I have an empty folder here, and if I do drush dl Drupal 8, it will take a moment to download what it needs to download, but hopefully it's cached most of the needful. All right, that gives me a folder called Drupal 8. And inside of this folder, you'll notice at the very top level, we have index.php and then we have vendor, right? They're right next to each other. On the other hand, if I say composer, let's see here, create project. Drupal Composer Drupal Project Get Master. And I hope that's the right command. We'll find out in just a second. Okay, I will copy the correct command from a suitable place. Oh, great, now it's deprecated. <laughs> so I think this means that we have probably three or four baselines uh, available, which might be a little, you know, 
something that you would think about if you were a D8 implementer and responsible for the site route. That's upstream's decision. As a CIVI guy, I just want to be able to take whatever the CIVI CRM packages are and throw them into whatever the Composer project is. Mark is uh, mentioning on chat that uh, D8.8 is the first version to officially support uh, Composer with a core provided template. Um, very good, very good. Ah, CMS version, I see. <laughs> this is fun because I've scripted this such that I basically never have to run it myself. There we go, now we're getting a project. So the key point is that you get different file structures and you get um, some different baselines and assumptions in each of these uh, project routes, right? So in here, there's an assumption that index.php is, is inside web slash index.php, right? Whereas in the other structure is in the root. Vendor, which is a list of all of the dependencies, including Civi CRM, and uh, that's why I care about it, uh, is uh, above web. Whereas here, vendor is inside web. So another difference between what uh, our, the CI infrastructure is using um, to install Civi CRM and the Round Earth plugin is that the Round Earth plugin is tuned to work well with Drupal project, right? I, I would be curious, I don't know, but I hope that Drupal project is pretty closely aligned with the new D8.8 official template. Um, however, whatever um, the current dis position is, as a Civi distributor, my perspective is that out in the world, that as people use Drupal and start adding Civi CRM into their Drupal sites, they will be coming from different backgrounds. So some people will be coming from the legacy template. Some people will be coming from the Drupal project template. Some people will be coming from the new D8.8 official uh, template. And I want Civi to be able to work in all of those, um, which requires a little bit more dynamism auto detection. Um, all right. So what were we talking about? Let me get back. Okay, it's strengths and weaknesses. So Composer is strong when you're just pointing a library. Where it starts to get complicated is when you're dealing with assets and when you want to provide patches to a library or when you want libraries that aren't published in the normal channels or when you want to automatically run a piece of code that um, 
will you know, compile some JavaScript files as part of the build process. And it took me a while to, to come up with a label for this. Um, I think of all of those features of Composer, because those are supported in Composer, as pressure relief valves. A pressure relief valve is something that's very useful and very important. It is very important that you be able to add a new script um, that executes after downloading your packages, right? At the same time, the entire ecosystem does not have the privilege of registering those scripts that run after you download. And if you, as a library provider, expect someone to execute a script, you're going to find some difficulty. Um, and the basic difficulty is that these pressure relief valves, and a lot of the Composer plugins are pressure relief valves, form a contract between the roots and the libraries. So, <clears throat> uh, for example, the uh, there's a, a plugin that handles patches, right? And if as an ecosystem, we all agree we're going to use the Seawegans patch version 1.0, then that's cool, and libraries can use that, and roots can use that. But if roots are sort of free to mix and match, and they don't choose to enable the Seawegans plugin, then any libraries that relied on the Seawegans plugin uh, for patches aren't going to work correctly because they've made an assumption that the project root has this feature enabled. And if there's a change, so if a new version of that plugin comes out, you go from version one to version two, which is actually, um, I believe, an issue that's coming up, that there is a version one going to version two, um, you're now going to have this point of contention where a library provider is publishing uh, materials that assume your system has Seawigans version two and your system actually has Seawigans version one or vice versa. Um, and Composer doesn't automatically handle this uh, situation well. It might report that there's a problem, but there is a, a, an amount of coordination that's required because these things are separate. So the main thing is, from my perspective, to try to keep the contract small and defined. Um, <clears throat> so, when you look at some of the code that I, I use, um, I am a little bit reticent sometimes about relying on popular plugins in the Composer ecosystem because it expands the surface area of Civi CRM's contract, right? If Civi CRM requires the root project to embrace a certain plugin with a certain configuration, then anytime there's an upgrade, we have to have the conversation or communication about how to update the root project to reference that. And I want to minimize that kind of um, work and coordination. All right, let's move on. Uh, so uh, pressure relief valves, Sorry, pressure relief valves are useful, but um, they have to be carefully moderated. And you might even say that there's a budget that Civi CRM um, can require one specific plugin or two specific plugins. But if it changes that, it's going to be a significant maintainability, deployability issue, communications issue. All right. So we covered that, we covered that. Um, there was the question about um, the Round Earth plugin. Uh, and <clears throat> there are several people who are using this uh, really good plugin um, called the Round Earth Civi CRM Composer plugin uh, to help install Civi on their D8 sites. It doesn't quite work for the CI purposes um, for loading from Git repos and whatnot. Um, and so what my strategy in that has been to look at the Round Earth plugin and all of the bits of glue that it put in and figure out why is that glue needed? 
can we make that glue unnecessary by improving the quality or structure of uh, the underlying code? Um, and if we can't make it necessary, how do we sort of isolate that? Um, and long story short, most of the things that it does are things that we can make unnecessary by improving the quality of our, our code or just improving a little bit of the RPHP. For example, downloading SQL files from the published tarballs of the stable release. We can replace that step with a different step that generates the SQL files on demand. It doesn't need to write the SQL file to disk. We, in normal PHP, we don't really write SQL files to disk. We just execute the SQL that we need. So the installer will just execute the SQL that it needs without writing anything to disk. Um, and those kinds of simplifications are, are nice. The one thing that is a really tough nub um, that it addresses that cannot be addressed nicely in, in vanilla, plain, uh, safe, portable composer practices is asset publication. When Civi CRM Core includes JS files and CSS files and image files, they need to get into the web directory. However, we as a library don't control the web directory, right? That's something that the project root dictates. We saw two different project routes in uh, the Drupal project template and in the Drush DL, uh, which position that differently. Um, and we don't get a say in where that's going to wind up. So there needs to be some kind of bridge that connects those. And Civi CRM Assets plugin tries to be the smallest possible bridge. Um, its responsibility is to identify any Civi related packages, which can mean Civi CRM dash core or Civi CRM dash packages or Anything with an info.xml file, if it's an extension, then it will recognize it as a Civi related and uh, search for assets in there. And it will sync the assets from your source tree, which may be private and offline, and put it into the public uh, assets folder, your web tree. All right, let's see. And I just wanted to do maybe a little demonstration here. So we have here um, a D8 project that we downloaded. Uh, this one was the Composer Create project. There's also the one from Drush. Uh, I think I'm going to use the one from Drush because uh, I think that'll run a little bit faster. But... Oh, right. So, uh, <laughs> apologies um, about that table. There were the two plugins. The The point of this table <laughs> is that in BuildKit, we want to do QA with all of this stuff. We want to make sure that Civi CRM deploys correctly in each kind of uh, standard project and that it works with different plugins. So we can set up a CI job which uses each of them. All right, so <clears throat> anyway. Sorry, back to our, our last significant task, building a basic site from Git. Right, so hopefully this is all that's needed. There's, it's not required for you to add any extra sections to the composer.json. Um, and the most of the dependencies that Drupal brings, we don't care about. Composer will automatically reconcile with the dependencies that Civi has. So I go to sandbox.pk. 
we have an empty D8 site that hasn't been installed at all. The goal is to install Civi on top of this. Uh, so I guess in the real world, someone would normally install Drupal before they have any of the Civi code. So let's do it that way. And then we're going to need our database. Copy all of our credentials. This is the fun part about doing an online demonstration. We get to watch the progress bar as it goes from 17 to 18 to 19. Look, oh, it did go to 19, good. I'm going to start copying this over so that we are prepared to run the command in a minute. Oops. <laughs> So now we have a basic site and we don't have CCRM. Let's download it. There's a question about assets um, in the chat that is a very good question. Uh, I'm going to come to that, or I, I'll talk about that just as soon as we finish the demo. which hopefully should only take another minute. It is nice that Composer caches all of these downloads. That's new. Oh, I see. So it's saying that it cannot delete this file, which is under site's default. And often Drupal will lock down that folder. So I'm going to guess that that's a permission issue with the folder. Yeah.
there we go. Now, then there is this here. All right, good, we have our code. We also need our plugin. Extend and now somewhere in our list of Drupal modules, there's a Civi CRM module. Hit install. Ah, and of course it broke. All right, so that was nice because this worked perfectly right before the call, right before the webinar, and. Now it didn't. <laughs> so I am going to move on, I think, to the question about assets. Um, that should not crash. We're at 50 minutes, so we're not going to do a debugging on that. Um, I'll have to do that offline. OK, so there's a question about assets, um, i.e. CSS, JS. Common ways of publishing assets are NPM, Yarn, Webpack, a little older, Bower. Um, and this is something where the Composer ecosystem, I feel, doesn't have a solution. They have several solutions. Um, so you can find plugins uh, or you can find documentation on Google where someone has used a Composer to uh, NPM bridge, right? And one form of that bridge is to map every prod, every uh, package that exists in NPM to a package in Composer. A different way is to daisy chain, to have Composer run its installation and then call out to NPM and have it run installation. Um, these are good and I, I mean they work for people. Um, it's good that people talk about it on Google. It is not good from my perspective as a library provider that there are so many different techniques because I can't just adopt one of them, right? If, if this were a root project, I could say, we're going to use the composer to NPM bridge in which every NPM package becomes a composer package and that's the way it's going to work. Since this code is going to get dropped into random roots where someone might have done that or they might have done something completely different. I don't get to choose. Um, and I, for me, it goes back to this distinction of root versus library. And there are certain assumptions that the root can make and assumptions the library can make. I believe that in the, the elegant version of Composer, um, the library providers are constrained in their assumptions to one directory. That's the directory they provide. So as the publisher of Civi CRM, I control this folder called Vendor Civi CRM Civi CRM Core, right? It, I should have full discretion on what goes on in there, but I have no say no direct say, I am not authoritative in what goes on outside of that folder. So there may be other things in the parent folders, there may not. Um, what that means is that all of the assets that I depend on are going to be in that folder or are going to be declared in there. And to make that work, I can use a plugin as a library author called the Downloads plugin. And if you look in Civi CRM's composer.json, you will find this section called Extra Downloads, right? And Angular files, jQuery files, exactly the stuff you would see in Bower or NPM. Um, this is just an instruction that says when creating the Civi CRM core folder, we also need to download this zip file and extract it into a corresponding uh, subtree. So the copy of angular-mocks, random example, 
that lives inside of the Civi CRM core folder under Angular Mox. That's something that I can define as the library author, right? I cannot reach out and inject a JavaScript file into some other package, right? Everything that I do is going to show up in here. Conversely, if I am a um, project owner, a root owner, I can assume that everything that the Civi CRM core re, uh, package provides, relies on, is either in that code or is a standard PHP dependency. Now, a lot of project structures have a functional problem. The vendor folder may be restricted from web access, or it may not even be visible on the web in any way. So the asset plugin reconciles that. Um, its specific purpose is to copy assets from the vendor tree into your web tree. Uh, let's see, do I have a folder here? Well, uh, wait clean. So in here, I have vendor CD CRM, CD CRM core, and I also have library CD CRM core. All of the JavaScript, CSS, and image files from Civ vendor Civi CRM, Civi CRM core have been synchronized over to libraries Civi CRM core. The name library Civi CRM core that might look like magic, uh, it is in fact coming from uh, the, the rounder. It's chosen to match what uh, they've done. They used library slash Civi CRM because that is something that the Drupal 8 file hierarchy standard allows us to use. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it just copies over those files. All right, so I, I hope that makes sense. Uh, are there more questions? or comments. Uh, before, oh yes, there's a question about uh, Drupal 9, uh, and somebody also emailed about that before the, the presentation. And, you know, as you all probably know, Drupal 9 is being presented as Drupal 8 minus deprecated functions and with a library upgrade. Uh, something that's been really cool as I, um, run through these tests, uh, set, setting up the test suites, I discovered that we actually get a report when we run the Civi test suites on top of Drupal 8 of all the deprecated function calls that it's using, which I think gives us a pretty good starting point for identifying um, which lines need to be changed. It then becomes hopefully a sort of uh, hunt and fix operation uh, where we've got like just a laundry list of files and lines to check where they do something that's deprecated and we update it. Um, when it's presented that way, it's usually a lot easier to find um, what to fix. By contrast with, um, with other ports to CMSs, we've been in more of a situation where you have to install and actually use the system um, to uncover where the deprecated calls are at runtime, uh, which can be tricky. All right, so there's a question about uh, timeline and what's remaining. Um, my, I, I don't have a timeline to give. Um, However, what I am really excited about is that running these tests gives us a fixed list of tasks of things that need fixing. And it's generally easier to organize when you can have that fixed list. Um, I 
in the process of getting this to build from Git, I, I also did some implicit testing and kept notes on to-dos. I need to file issues for those. And it generally takes a bit longer to file a cogent issue uh, than it does to make a bullet point in your, your private notes. So uh, I need to file those. Uh, there's a question about how uh, to be supportive of uh, this and move things forward. Um, a, uh, that's a good question I, and, and an excellent sentiment. Um, I think that the, you know, the main thing is that we need to file some issues and uh, encourage discussion and, and work on them. Um, I, and I don't have a, uh, a better answer than that. There's a question, what is the expected final packaged installation going to look like? Uh, it's a good question. My target right now is to be able to have a, is a budget of two commands, basically. If you have a working Drupal 8 installation, uh, like those two statements would give you, then we should be able to do the rest in about two or three commands. Um, the command, you know, I would prefer it to be prettier than this. But if somebody had to copy and paste that from the documentation, I don't think that's bad. Uh, I'm not 100% certain that this will be the final command. Uh, in particular, it goes back to these pressure relief valves and the other plugins and things that are required at the top level project. If we're able to make the system work with only these commands, then I think we keep it at that. If we have to branch out and use another plugin, another pressure relief valve, another top level configuration that becomes part of the contract, then the command is going to change to something I expect will be like this. Uh, CVCRM slash import plugin, composer import. The idea in that structure would be that the top level project can use a plugin which imports configuration options from somewhere else. There's a very good plugin that's actually pretty popular um, along these lines put out by Wikimedia, I believe, um, called the Merge plugin, which comes very close. And I, I, I would almost like to see this as a patch on the Merge plugin. The only issue with the Merge plugin is it doesn't quite get down to the two lines to perform an installation. Um, it requires a little bit of install this thing, tweak this option, and uh, copy some files. Um, I really want to make it a, a smooth, a brief installation. So if we're required to, uh, to uh, define some of these pressure relief valves, I would see us writing a plugin which specifically imports things into the composer.json. There's a question about, um, given that the structure isn't final today, what should you do? Uh, should you use the round earth method? And I would say yes. I think that there's uh, a, lot, a lot of people who are in the round earth boat at the moment. Um, so I don't think that that's going to get like a, a cold um, cutoff at any point. And remember that the 
the philosophy here is to be able to mix Civi CRM into many different project structures. So if you start out with a rounded project structure, that is another project structure that is um, very reasonable to fit into. On a functional level, right now there are a few bugs in the asset plugin structure that aren't in the round earth plugin. Those bugs don't stop the test suite from running, but they would be very visible to a user. And since those bugs are there, I you know if I were starting out a deployment, a excuse me, a production site right now, I would still be using the round earth plugin. Um, just because the trade-offs work out better for a production site there. However, in the long run, I would like to see the approach in the assets plugin um, where it's able to pull in from the Git code canonically uh, become more of the, the convention and maybe update the round earth uh, project template uh, to, to use that kind of structure um, because I think it leads to a smoother transition path. Um, when, uh, when somebody starts out on D8 uh, installing Civi CRM, uh, they just want to get a stable version, but over time, they need to throw in patches, they need to use alternate Git repos, and I would like for the story that they go through to be a fairly conventional composer user story. Um, and I, I think that will require aligning it a bit more uh, with the, the newer project structure. Uh, there's an, a good comment from Andrew and, and Dave D that uh, if people want to make a difference on the timelines, the best thing to do are to contribute towards it and to clone human beings. So if we can do those two tasks, then it'll be easy. Uh, but more seriously, there's a, a link to the MIH. Uh, I haven't looked at it uh, in the past few days, but that's good to check out. All right. I think we're at an hour, so it's probably a good time to, uh, to stop the call. I will find out about uh, publishing this webinar uh, later. All right, thank you everyone, bye.